Danny Moses, I'm going to give you three names. These are three musicians that made up a band. This is going to be a hard one, so I'm hoping you Four. guess it. Okay, here we go. Nope. Leo Lyons, Chick Churchill, Rick Lee, Alvin Lee, and a gentleman named Joe Gooch. Does that mean anything to you? No, it's okay. not the Chipmunks. Okay. No. These were some of the founding members of the band 10 years after. And I'm going to explain to you why we're going to Ten talk about Ten years before I was born, I'm sure. Go ahead. Ten years prior to your birth, maybe-ish, although we're in similar ages. Mm. It was probably ten years after I was born, ten years before you. So people can do that math. By the way, uh, Dan Nathan and Danny Moses, this is the On The Tape Podcast. I'm Guy Adami. I was never in the band ten years after. Dan Nathan, Danny Moses, and you had a great conversation uh earlier didn't you dan we did danny and i uh, had a great conversation with michael Cantrowitz. you guys know him as cantro he is the chief investment strategist over there at piper sandler so stick around for that when danny guy and i are done the reason why i brought up the great band 10 years after um alvin lee by the way as well you might recall they sang a song their famous song is i'd love to change the world but i don't know what to do so I'll leave it up to you. I would love for the world, Dan Nathan, to be different this time. I would love to be able to say all the indicators we're saying is different. The world has changed. I would love to change the world, but I got to tell you something. I don't know what to do. So I'm going to leave it up to the audience. Maybe they can get back to us, but I'm going to leave it up to both of you guys and maybe Cantra later to explain to me why it's getting different this time thoughts well it's funny you know and, and Kentra is going to get to some of this i love when people and we've been talking a lot about this danny like the kind of history rhyming if yep. not repeating and you know that expression in the markets every time you hear it's different this time but it's interesting you know he brought up this period in the summer of 2000 right no one knew that the march 2000 high was the high okay but it happened a lot of similarities right we just had this kind of rate hiking cycle that was about to come to an end and you know the market sold off really 13 14 percent to its lows in the summer and then went it on to this kind of 14 15 percent rally almost got us back to those prior highs we know what happened after that right the the s p got cut in half not too dissimilar to what happened in 2007 we were in a rate hiking cycle that was about to come to an end no one could see anything coming to an end a lot of folks thought we were just kind of entering another phase of a bull market so when you think about the s p being 25 percent off its uh, lows in october 15 percent off the lows in march and we're getting back towards certain levels that are just an earshot away from the jan 2022 all-time highs a lot of folks think we're about to enter into a new phase of the bull market so again you know throughout my career i like analogs to other periods i think there's just a lot of similarities to those prior two highs yeah listen i'm gonna throw a name at you guy please, you ready please okay. gutson borglum pardon me <laughs> gutson borglum he played right defense uh for i think the California Golden Seals in the early 1970s. Right. He was the sculptor of Mount Rushmore. Okay. Come yeah, on. A, yeah, okay. So I'm watching the four central bankers yesterday. When you look at them over in Portugal that are sitting there, right? You eat up Bank of Japan, right? Obviously, Powell, Lagarde, and Bailey, mm -hmm. right? Those four comprise basically everything that matters as far as central banks. And I'm thinking to myself, here, the, this is not Mount Rushmore. No, but this, not, okay. not by I'm any not, stretch. I'm not <laughs> comparing it to Mount Rushmore, but I started thinking to myself, at the end of the day, all this shit we talk about coming... This is really all that has mattered since, you know, since, sorry, since 2009. It's really all that's mattered has been central banks proving liquidity. Here's what's interesting, Guy. You remember the movie National Treasure? Sure. That the was second Nick one. Cage. Book of Secrets. By the way, hold on a second. Before yeah. you even go down this road, yeah. who was the actress in that? Help me because- Helen Mirren was in it, by the way. By I, the can friend. I tell you something? Yeah. Dame Helen Mirren, who yeah. I love. Yeah. I love her. Yeah. But the 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 younger actress that played Nick Cage's wife, the ex-wife. Yeah, and they subsequent, yeah. Okay, we'll look that up in the anyway, show notes or yeah. something. So Book of Please. Secrets was about finding these secrets that have to do with Mount Rushmore and the Resolute Desk and all these things that were going on. Sure. Do you know what they found behind Mount Rushmore in that movie? What? Gold, Danny. Gold. They found gold, a thing of gold. Danny. So when they blow up this Mount <laughs> Rushmore, I'm more than talking about gold here. I'm just thinking Spoiler myself. Spoiler Danny. I haven't seen the second one. Jeez. No, but but when you bring it, what's behind a gold? So when they fail and fall apart, it'll be, it'll be gold indeed. But no, I was watching that and thinking to myself, is it that simple, stupid in terms of liquidity? And the answer is pretty much yes, where liquidity has come from. And at some point, this will matter. And I want to harken back to the 
S&P in the fourth quarter of 2021. We started the show at the beginning of 2021. We've always been constructive, and we've been right more than we've been wrong in terms of the trends picking up in the market and what to watch for and what was happening. Remember, Q4 21, the S&P started roughly at 4,400. It had this 400-point run. We said at the time, that should just be taken off the map. It didn't, didn't, didn't make sense. The Fed was already indicating quantitative tightening was coming on top of the Fed going to be starting their rate hike push. He gave fair warning already that was going to be happening. I find that level interesting without looking on a chart that we ran from 4,400 to 4,800. We're not stalling out here. Believe me, I'm not calling this a stall out. The market still is doing what it's doing. Mm -hmm. We're here on the 4,400 level. But I look back and think to myself, what were we thinking about as it went there? Why did it end up selling back off again? The end sell, sell back off because... We had a slow, things were slowing down, right? The Fed was obviously on a rate hike path. We saw deterioration starting to occur here and there. You know, nothing cataclysmic, but here we sit. Fed is now going to be 525 basis points in come three weeks from now or four weeks from now, whatever that might be. And it's now 78, 83% chance we're going to be raising at that point. And I'm sitting here, I'm thinking to myself, at some point, the narrative will shift mm -hmm. to, okay, so... I'm just thinking back to these periods and trying to stay sane at the same time. All the matters. How is that part going? Not well at all, actually. Because <laughs> I got to tell you yeah. something. I'm having a lot I of understand. difficulties with it. So my point is that I'm putting my brain in the I put my brain in the closet. I'm watching the, well, like the Mount Rushmore of central banks yesterday and thinking to myself, this is what this is what we're relying Our upon. Yes. And the answer is yes. In the end of the day, and I think people, this is where I underappreciate it. I always will, and I'm happy to always be wrong on this. I'm not going to rely on central bankers to continuously always bail us out of problems, but time and time again, I'm watching these four and I'm like, yep, we're going to drive ourselves into a And then what are they going to do? The thought is that I'll buy the dip because they're going to print. So anyway, I'm trying to reconcile all of this, but we can see things are happening. Listen, the data hasn't been bad. You've had some decent data come out in the last few days. I will tell you that jobless claims today was an anomaly because of holiday last week, mm -hmm. whatever it is, what it is. There are certain trends in Cantor we'll talk about. They're in place. They're not going to change my mind. And just because the S&P is at a certain level, and i got to come back and make up a story about why it's there, the reasons that it's there are not healthy, in my opinion, meaning it's not supported by the underlying breadth of the market yet. And so stock picking matters. And they're, listen, we talked about overstock last week, Dan. Mm -hmm. Again, it's a tiny company. I know it's a billion and a half, two billion company. But here are the opportunities that will always be available. So you can be constructively bearish on overall and be bullish on single names. I just want to make one point here. And, and again, you know, we're, we're talking, you know, Guy and I have been doing, Guy's been doing a show called Fast Money. CNBC's on CNBC. Fast Money. 100 years. Years. 100 years. No, Danny. Yeah. It's not that long. But, oh, by the way, can I tease? Am I allead to do this? Yeah, you can do this. It's your no. podcast. You can do whatever you Danny want. Danny Moses will be appearing as a mm. member of the Fast Money desk. I want to say July 16th. Don't give 18th. the exact date because the the assassins can hang out in that window behind. I've seen oh, them do stop things it. back Nobody's there. Gonna, All right, but, but here, I just want I just yeah. want to make this point is that if you go back to, to the start of 2020, the S&P was 3,600. And, you know, it got as low as, what, 2,200 or something like that in the throes of the pandemic. And then we had that move all the way to what you're talking about, Danny, 4,800. And then at the lows last year, we got to about 3,500. And here we are again at 4,400. And so I bring up the point about Fast Money, a program that I have also been doing since, you know, 2000 um, and 11 here is that sometimes, and especially the way that we came up in the business, we were traders. We've been staring at machines every tick of everything that we watch every day. Most investors don't do that, mm -hmm. right? So, so if they're tuning into Fast Money or you're listening to our podcast here or whatever, you enjoy the markets. You enjoy the back and forth the way you enjoy watching Sports Center and hearing, you know, the TikTok of uh, of the of the PGA t uh, tournament over the course of the weekend or whatever. So sometimes we get trapped in these kind of like punditry, like sort of circles and everything like that. Most people are dollar cost averaging. They're putting a little bit into the markets every month, every quarter, that sort of thing. And if you're just doing that, you're doing just fine. fine. I mean, that's the game, right? Like that's how you have consistency over a long period of time investing. And if you're here, sometimes we, I think, take, we never do victory laps here. We probably put a little too much pressure on ourselves when our day-to-day -day calls are wrong or our week-to-week -week, or we get locked into some of those narratives. But you said something interesting, Danny, you know, from the start of this podcast in January, 2021, I think directionally on most things as it relates to the economy, as it relates to sentiment, as it relates to trends in the markets, that sort of thing. I think we've been pretty good at a lot of that sort of stuff. So if you're getting turned around because we didn't say buy the market at the start of this year, I don't know. I mean, that's no, a different thing because we've gotten a lot of things like crude rates, you know, like, like, listen, you're right. If, if people just started listening 
and in you know three or four months ago, they'd be like, "What the? What welcome the hell?" Welcome to our new listeners. Right. By well, the way. Yeah, welcome to our new listeners on the tape. Um, but if you did, you wouldn't understand kind of the process yeah. that we go through and pointing out things like buy now, pay later when it had its when it came on the two years ago, or some of these one off companies, mm -hmm. right, which were going to be issues, or SoftBank, what what that meant, them pulling out of the market. Those are the type of things. So we've just gotten caught, Dan, to your point, caught up in not trying to explain ourselves necessarily, but to explain that what you're seeing right now, just so everyone, is, this is not normal. And I think the biggest struggle for me from the behavioral finance aspect is what is it going to be or what I do everything I can to try to fit the narrative for where the market is. And I really have a hard time getting there. It always goes lower than you think it's going to go to mm -hmm. the downside and it goes higher than you think it will to the upside. But as we sit here today, I think what we can do that's constructive is what should people be looking for and what is the catalyst going to be that will say, hey, it's kind of irrefutable that we're slowing down. And at some point, we're going to catch up on the earnings front and earnings aren't going to be great in the back half of the year. And Cantro, not to promote what's he going to does a great job of talking about that later, like what he's watching. And these are just facts and statistics, right? This is not the behavioral finance aspect. But listen, it's frustrating because we want to help people and entertain people at the same time. And yeah, we don't want to be, quote, wrong, but we're not going to change our logic behind how we think about things because of what the market is doing. A few things. So I th think for a lot of people, they have a number in the S&P. Let's just call it for now 4,400 where we are, and they solve to get to that number. In other words, the number's here, which means by definition these things have to be happening. Instead of looking what's happening, saying this doesn't add up and 4,400 makes zero sense, so you're solving for the outcome you already have. And I'm not trying to be too wonky here, but there's some of that going on as well. Number one. Number two, Diane Kruger. Oh, that's Diane it. Diane yes. Kruger. By the way, now you went back on it. Do you know how many years it took to build Mount Rushmore? 17. 14. About the same time as QE went on. But again, I can ah, go ah, ahead. Ah, go ah, ahead. Ah, uh, ah. Yeah. Number two. Yeah. So back to Diane Kruger <laughs> yeah. for a second. She played Helen in the movie Troy. Okay. She is a beautiful woman. She might as well have been Helen of Troy because she could have, what is it, the one that launched a thousand ships? This is what ships? we talk about now and we can't, you know, we don't no, want no, to no, be. No, no, yeah. no. You brought up the movie. Okay. I couldn't think of Fair the actress. Enough. So All I right. wanted to come back to that. Perfect. All right. Now let's talk about this as well in terms of what can change my opinion of what's going on. I don't think there's a whole hell of a lot because the die has already been cast. Like everything has been put into place. The only thing that really hasn't played out is the market behavior, the, the participation of the market to the downside. I will continue to submit. It's a foregone conclusion that something's got to break here. All the things that I look at, all the indicators, and I'm not dogmatic. I look at a lot of different things. They are flashing mm -hmm. red look at across the yen, a spectrum you. of right. different things. Yeah, you mentioned currencies, dollar yen, flashing red, inverted yield curve, flashing red, currency crises in country we don't talk about, flashing red. It's all out there. Forget about valuations. Now, Apple, and I'm going on a bit of a diatribe here, Apple's on, on autopilot. It's a $190 stock. It's within a whisper of a $3 trillion market cap. Good for Apple. Great company. Everybody loves it. I totally get it. Apple, and I did the homework on this, Dan Nathan, I believe is the top 15 holding, 1.5, of 354 different ETFs, which means by definition, as passive money comes in, that money is going to find its way into Apple. So for a lot of people out there that say, I don't even own Apple, yes, you do. Yeah. And good for you, by the way. But the same thing that works on the upside works on the downside. Yeah, and I just want to reiterate, you know, one point. So we had Josh Brown and Michael Batman. TRB. Yes, this was the, the last reform broker. week of Q1, okay? And we were still trying to kind of make sense of what just happened in the regional banking sector. And I think that we can all agree that there was a level of bearishness and, and it just made sense to actually, you know, not, you know, kind of, you know, shoot first, ask questions later in the throes of that, at least from some of us who have the PTSD from the financial crisis and the like here. But one of the things that I remember saying at the time is like, I, I actually was not constructive on stocks. I was not looking to buy them um, until we had more clarity about that. But I said, the best trade that you could probably do over the next quarter, you remember this guy? I said, every day on the close, Buy a little bit of the same amount of the QQQ, mm -hmm. I remember the NASDAQ 100. Okay, that's the ETF because we were talking about the defensive nature because there was money that already started moving into that. Okay, and, and it could have been the AI hype. It could have been a whole host of other things. But if you look at the range in which the NASDAQ 100, the QQQ, has traded over the last quarter from 310 at its lows in April to its highs just a few weeks ago, um, I think at 373. 
So a 20% range and the average price I think this is the closing price is 335 versus a price right now of 363 working out that's how people for the most part should be investing now if a portion of your investable capital is interesting to you to follow guys like us or follow people that are you know who have other podcasts or other shows of this or whatever and you like one-off trades or you like trading crypto or you like trading currencies or you like trading commodities whatever the hell it might be then you should express those views in that manner everyone's got their hobbies and i know a lot of people have hobbies in the markets but for the most part you should be employing strategies where you are just you know slow and steady and wins the race i agree with all that i'm going to go a bit off the rails here and no pun intended with my following comment if I were to ever be fiscally sound enough where I could have a hobby that I could immerse myself in, does anybody want to take a guess as what that would hobby would be? Anybody here? No? Danny? Dan? No. Music critic. Oil painting. Oh, actually, you know what? DJ on the Sirius XM of their new Led Zeppelin channel that's going to be launched probably towards the end of this year like with that. Guy Adami no, actually, that's helming not, the that's mic. Does that idea. make sense? It does make a lot of sense. Uh I would be building model railroads. And what? my fascination with model railroads started back in, if you recall, the Adams family. Gomez Adams had his model railroad set in his like den or something. And I was fascinated by that. So I will be in my basement building out an N gauge model railroad set in terms of hobbies. Sorry about that, Danny. Please Excellent. continue. Well, I think on that, you Thank talked you. about DJing. Let's talk about the stress test for a second. Oh, okay. See, now it's. How you did see I what do? just happened? You yeah. see, like the switch yeah. went yeah, off of me because now I was in. As I said, it's Damone says off I was the rails. I've been such a good host. You wore the Damone shirt that I got you. Yet? I don't know if it fits. It might be a little small. Damone from Fast Times original so, and high. He's an extra large. Yeah, I'm a big person, as you know. I got But anyway, I have not worn it yet. I will. But yes, please. I woke up in a good mood. I'm still in a good mood. But go ahead with the bank stress test. Don't push me. <laughs> too I'm far. not going to go right. I won't. We won't go please. into all this. We expected all the big banks to be able to pass the stress test and a couple things on it. Solomon, however long he lasts at Goldman, cannot get away from this Marcus Green Sky quick enough. The fact that Goldman Sachs, were, you know, came out worse on a consumer loan stress test. I mean, think about that. Goldman was nowhere near this sector three years ago, and they're the ones they're performing on the on the stress load would, would perform the worst. They can't get rid of this yeah. soon enough. But here's what's interesting: all the stress tests, everyone's fine. Cap One obviously wouldn't. Anyone with a lot of consumer exposure obviously would get hit on those type of unemployment and those losses. How about you use that in the dot plot and you run those unemployment? Oh. Can you imagine if we even got near any of the levels that they're stressing for where the markets would be? The rates would be at zero. The Fed will have cut to zero. Trust me. And we are balance sheet would be 12 trillion. Where's inflation? So my point is that like it's kind of a dumb exercise in the sense of if the banks ever have to experience anything that they're stressing for, it will be alleviated. It will be some program. Oh, we're going to buy credit card debt for you. I just find the whole thing ridiculous. Well, listen. The banks are utilities. You can own them to a degree. And they want to increase their buybacks and pay a higher dividend. Great. Bank America obviously came out that they're sitting on a massive hundred billion dollar mark to market loss potentially on their treasury book, but who cares? That's for different yeah, days. Well, wait, but, but didn't we talk about that back yeah, in March? You said like, why how, is it underperforming? How, right. Well, yeah. So the underperformance was huge. But how can these large money center banks that have the same uh, I guess, competition for deposits the, the way the regionals did. They must have these things. A lot of people were poo-pooing it, and they're saying, well, as a percentage, right, of their basically um, asset versus liability, it's not going to make a big deal. But this this could be a huge Well, the deal. thing, think about this. They are in the process. Yellen's mentioned it. I think Barr's mentioned it. They know there's going to be other deals that are going to be needed. Yeah. So they need the big banks to be in a good position so yeah. they can swallow these other banks. I'm not saying there's anything that's imminent, imminent, but there's a reason they ran specifically headline on commercial property exposure, right? They were segregating out. Again, they always did those kind of areas. And this wasn't for the smaller regional banks. Obviously, the stress test wasn't for them. But now they're going to raise the requirements. So we're going to see what the capital requirements are going to be as far as risk weightings and so forth, which are going to go up. The point is that it's just really a show. And I didn't expect anyone to, quote, obviously fail this. But I find it ironic that, you know, Goldman, obviously, on the consumer finance side, which they're going to give, they, they pay $2.24 billion. That was Solomon's deal for Green Sky alone. They're trying. They can't even get a three or four hundred million dollars. They're going to write it down thing. to zero. Exactly. So, and to your point about David Solomon, he was always viewed as an outsider at Goldman Sachs. Came from Bear Stearns, so he had a bullseye on his back from day one. There were a lot of people, obviously, in the firm that wanted Harvey Schwartz to get that job. He did not. Harvey's now running the Carlisle Group. The typical lifespan of a CEO at Goldman Sachs since the 1950s is about six years ish. If you go back and do the math, he's right up against it. This spring. 
of 2024. It'll probably be about that. So there's definitely a timeline in terms of how long he's going to be there. I think Montag or somebody, I don't know exactly. Tom Montag is so, the next so, guy. So, so very interesting, though, because we've been tracking all these articles in the journal. It seems like somebody is yeah. leaking this oh, stuff to the journal. 100%. Right. But so, he's a Solomon so, ally, so, right? So, so, yes. So he is a Solomon ally. So he was running basically a lot of the operations. He was in the number two to Moynihan. He came to Merrill, um, I think in late 08 or so, and he had a huge run. So they remember they brought a bunch of Goldman mm -hmm. folks in there, that sort of thing. So that was actually a really interesting move. And I wonder if that was to kind of get that camp off his back a little bit. Here's, here's a guy that you guys know well. That article in the journal a couple of weeks ago where Lloyd Blankfein was holding court at that kind of Goldman yep. confab or whatever and openly critical of him was um, really interesting. Because historically it's like Pratt, Pres past presidents and current presidents, they'll never speak poorly yeah. about the current guy or gal. That goes outside the norm. like David Solomon. Now, I mean, like, I get it if you're one of these old Oh, Parker you've been to guys. one of his parties, obviously. No, I haven't. But, oh, I actually have seen him, DJ. <laughs> yeah. um, that was at a Super yeah. Bowl, at, you know, at a party, um, you know, in February of 2022. No, I, what I like about him is he's just cut from a different cloth mm -hmm. of a lot of these bank CEOs and ultimately – you know, I, I kind of feel like, you know, Jamie Dimon and the rest of the guys who run these money centers, they all look kind of similar, right, for the most part. I think all of them are grooming women to take over, if you think about it. I mean, obviously, City has a CEO um, that's a woman. Um, but, you know, Goldman has always been a different animal when it comes to the banks. And so I don't think you want somebody who looks like a money center bank CEO running that bank, do you? Are these podcasts recorded? Yeah. So, in other words, no, you can not arc. You can archive them. 100%. And like in two years, you can come back and say on July 30th. Yes. Say, say it's the 30th? Correct. Or June 30th. June 30th. 30th. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. I said the no, following today. thing. Yeah. What's today? No, it will come out on June 30th. Okay. You are correct. So Sorry. on June 30th, Guy Adami said the following thing. So like two, three years, even if I'm not around anymore, well, we you can go you, we back. You'll and, be around. What do you got? The first woman CEO of Goldman Sachs, I'm going to say her name and just want you, again, archive it. Erica Leslie. Remember that name. Now, it doesn't mean anything Two to anybody. Names. Exactly. Two first names. And I say that because I used to work with her at JR, and I won't get into the nitty-gritty detail, but I used to call her Leslie Erica because of exactly that. Two first names. Funny story, though. She sort of ran accounting, and she was ahead of—she kept track of all our trading P&L. And one day after the close, she came up to the desk, and I had a particularly shitty day. And she Because said, you added things wrong? or because Well, you, funny you should say that. Yeah. And she said, how did this happen? And I explained to her the trade. And she said in front of everybody, well, it looks like you traded backwards. And people still laugh to about that to this day. That's my Erica Leslie story. In terms of the bank stress test, Danny, which you brought up, I didn't because I was going to avoid it. But I'll say this. What was that bank with with the Silicon, Silicon, yeah, what Silicon was the name Valley of it? Silicon Valley Civ Silicon Valley Bank, yeah. right? When did they go under? March. March, right? That was the 16th, one sixth largest bank in the United States ish, right? Mm -hmm. Pretty large bank. Um, if they had been under the auspices, would have passed. Word, pardon me? Would have passed. They would have passed the bank stress test. Correct. So I ask you, Danny Moses, what fucking good is a bank stress test if the 16th largest bank in the country would have passed? Not That's very good. Not very good. Right. Not very. You could so, take that to the bank. Well, you, isn't it better yeah. than not no, having no, some sort of stress no, test? No. No. It have the had stress test for the right things. I mean, there was no duration risk. There was there was no yield curve risk in this whole thing. They totally missed the boat. They were testing against things that the banks already figured out. You got to be looking ahead. What can go wrong? There are a bunch of wankers. Bank stress test. These are people that couldn't get a freaking job at a bank. So instead, they're the guys and gals that make up the bank right, well, stress Listen, test. before the big short gets in here, I, I just want to make a just point saying. is that, you know, like all of this, there was railing against all these stress tests and all the regulation that came in after the financial crisis. And you think about what happened during the pandemic. I mean, those are the things that you were stress testing these systemically important sort of institutions. They held up pretty well. OK. And so just because we, you know, it didn't cover some of the regionals, and just let's remember. So I'm not going to call that them a regional, but I get it. Turned back guy in 2018 and 19. Yeah, I know over heavy lobbying, and so like my point is, is like a lot of this regulation that came after the financial crisis, it's kind of done its job in a way, but it's also turned these banks into what looks like utilities. Like they're never going to trade at the valuations that they did pre-crisis because of this regulation. So for the most part, a lot of the stuff's working out, Danny. 
No, listen, it, it is. It's a token. Like I said, they do it because they they've done it since the financial crisis. They have to do it. And it, listen, the banks have, I could argue that the bank multiples have suffered as a result of capital ratios, which I think is a good thing that they're required to hold more. But let's just move off of that and look at the banks in general. There's layoffs occurring. I mean, within Goldman, obviously, they're downgrading their MDs or mm -hmm. whatever they do there, you know, guy. And we're seeing- Calling the herd. Calling the herd. And we are obviously seeing a slowdown in deal making across the board. That's not, that's not new. There are some green shoots that are coming out here. And the one thing that Goldman didn't do was- diversify like Morgan Stanley did. And that always is who they benchmark themselves against. They don't have the kind of that retail uh, brokerage presence that Morgan Stanley has been able to build and kind of create more consistent revenue streams that have occurred. They went to the consumer finance area, which was a mistake. But beyond that, I want to move into a different area if I could Please. here, because I'm not going to talk about NVIDIA right away, but I find it interesting that Micron, right, which reported obviously a loss as expected, not as bad of a loss. And then so things are so, so Micron is more of a memory chip provider, as everybody kind of knows, symbol MU, uh, 70 billion market cap, I believe, Dan, if to round that area or something like that. And stocks certainly, but what's funny to me is that of all the names, right? So they obviously have a big issue because China is on them on their cybersecurity stuff. So it's kind of been a big overhang and they don't make money. But what's funny to me is I'm, I watch, I read, read through the call transcript and everything that went on. They don't mention a AI enough, Dan. They don't, they don't mention they sell chips or more memory chips, mm -hmm. but yep. chips that are indirectly used in some for some AI reason, right? And you think about like all the hoopla. And why is that? Why is it that this stock doesn't move? Is it is it there's a China risk on it? Is it that they're not getting announcing new orders related to? Is it because they're not profitable? So you can't dream the dream in terms of what valuation you want to put out, Dan. I, I put well, that question funny. to you so, because so memory yeah. though for you know twenty years has been the ultimate commoditized yeah. you know kind of area within the space. And when you think about, I mean, it's highly cyclical. And you know they had the huge benefit. One of the reasons why earnings are, are down this year is that all the double and triple ordering that went on in 2020 and 2021. So you're seeing um, this big pullback in that. And there's a glut, I think, on the market. And so, um, again, how can they speak to AI? Well, they can talk about the increased build out of data centers and the like and, and all that sort of thing. But that's going to be a 2024, 2025 thing. And right now they're just suffering from, I think, you know, the hangover from what's going on over the last few years. So they don't got the story here. And I think China is overhanging. But Guy, to your point about Apple and just, you know, which, you know, phone manufacturer in general, Micron mentioned, you know, that that business. Well, no, so, so smartphones are down, uh, PCs are down. Okay, so when you look at Micron's biggest customers, it's LG, it's Dell, it's Lenovo, it's HP, um, you know, it's Arrow, it's some of the contract manufacturers, Xiaomi in China. Um, smaller percents, Apple's about a 6% customer. So so they're exposed in, in an in a, in a area that there's not a lot of pricing this power. This is a commodity. Right? Yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's mm -hmm. a massive commodity. So anyway, I just wanted to mention it because you, you, normally you see on any news and they didn't really stress it enough. So again, yeah. not my area. But let me say this, yeah. since you also, Dan, brought it up and then you brought it up. I'm quoting now from the CEO. The recent Cyberspace Administration of China, mm -hmm. CAC, decision is a significant headwind that is impacting our outlook and slowing our recovery. That's from the CEO of Micron. Why do I bring it up? Because obviously what we also saw this week, Dan, was rhetoric from here, the United States, to again, China in terms of chips. The Biden administration, again, flexing. I'm not commenting whether or not it's the right thing to do. I mean, that's not what I'm here for. What I'll tell you, though, is there will be reciprocity at some point. And the fact that these tech stocks just continue to go on their merry way, not pricing in any pain whatsoever if China were to sort of retaliate, is shocking to me. Go back three months ago, and NVIDIA talked about the potential headwinds in this U.S.-China, vis-a-vis China-Taiwan situation and the problems that would be created for them. And again, NVIDIA sold off a bit on this. I get it but not nearly to the extent that I think the market should be pricing it in. Well, it's interesting. And Carter Braxton Worth made CBW. this point on uh, Worth Charting um, earlier in the week. He talked about like the, the, the semiconductor index is not making new highs relative to the S&P 500. When you look at the SMH, the ETF, that tracks the semiconductor index. NVIDIA makes up nearly 19% of the weight now. Taiwan Semi makes up 11.5%. So you can do the math there. A third of the SMH are two stocks that are very exposed to China right now. They're very much in the narrative about demand for these high-end chips that go into 
um, you know, basically these supercomputers that are enabling the compute for these large language models and generative AI that go into data centers, right? So if you think of the Microsoft Azure, or you think about the Google Cloud or uh, Amazon's AWS, that they are rushing to basically layer on these sorts of services to grow their cloud share because all sorts of companies that are not going to be buying you know, NVIDIA's H100 chip because they're $20,000 that go into a supercomputer that costs hundreds of thousand dollars and the compute is much more expensive. So, th so this is what's happened here. There's been this massive rush, right, to get access to these chips. I think the point about China is that a lot of the manufacturing used to obviously happen for these chips, but a lot of demand for Chinese companies. And we've mentioned this stat that NVIDIA has already seen a billion dollars worth of orders from ByteDance alone, which is the owner of TikTok, okay? That billion dollars this year is more than all of the Chinese demand that NVIDIA saw for last year. So if you're telling me the stock that went from 300 to 400 on that guidance that they gave um, late last month in May, I'm telling you that that could be triple ordering and you might see a deceleration in this sort of demand. And that is what I guess I'd turn this back to what Micron saw over the last three years, what goes up, people can come down. And just the gravity in markets, I think when you're in the middle of a moment here, you know, you can't see the potential for deceleration, but here's a stock that trades very expensive to its peers, very expensive to its market, and is the poster child for all the excitement in this thing. So uh, again, I just don't find these things particularly interesting. And the fact that the semis are not making new relative highs. The S&P tells me they're stalling, and a lot of this enthusiasm is in two names. You know who you will not hear any of these comments out of China from? So China just banned this guy with 4.7 million followers on, on Twitter. He's, he writes in China. He writes about finance, mm -hmm. economic, because he was writing negative. They took him off Twitter. So his name is Wu, but you won't. You won't see anything relating to a slowdown in orders. Wait, of are you anymore. saying that Elon Musk, the owner of Twitter, is doing the bidding for China? It's because, possibly, because but he's China on Weibo. Really important for him, right? Exactly. So he he writes on Weibo, I guess it's pronounced. Um, yeah. And he was commenting on the stock market and unemployment rate, and they basically took him off. I don't know if, if he's been seen since, but just wait, so you is know, he off of Twitter here in the in, in like outside of China? Because Twitter is yeah. obviously not. Oh, that's a good China. question. So he has four point seven million followers on Twitter. Okay, I don't but know. But he's if off he's Weibo, which Weibo is basically Sorry, correct on the firewall on the Chinese side. Right, he wrote, he's written books on Tencent. Like this guy, yeah, you know, he's yeah. a very well known guy. Anyway, yeah. he's not, which tells me no good news is coming out of China. So in the late nineteen sixties, early nineteen seventies, I joined the Cub Scouts, and then you graduate from the Cub Scouts. We blows, we blows. Yeah, which just made me I thought think you go of Eagle Scouts. No, 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 no. Okay. That's way That's beyond. The last thing. But, okay. Not that, again, that either one of you care, and this might actually get edited out, which I'm fine with, but the audience might be interested to know that I was actually kicked out of Weeblos because I was running a dice game. I no joke. It. You were not Bronx Tale dice game? It's sort of, yeah. Because I was so bored by what the hell Horrible. the the scout master was doing. Mrs. Hoffman, by the way. I remember it was like it was yesterday. And they had to call my parents and say, guy's no longer welcome in the Weeblos, which is different than Weebo, but... I completely digress. You know what else has been interesting? And watch this segue. I can't wait. No, just watch this because we've gone this... from toy trains to keep going. Let's yeah. go. Well, okay. that's the train of train of thought. You like yeah. what I did there? Yeah. Uh, inflation's a problem, right? We have. I think really? we all agree. Well, no, but I'm just going. Yeah. So I think um, I want to say sort of wages represent a like twenty percent ish of CPI. What do you think a bigger input for CPI is, Danny? I'm just curious. Be housing, shelter. I was going to say rent. Yeah, rent. Yeah. I never saw that musical, by the way. Yeah. I probably should have. I you don't know should. if it's still here no. or not. Maybe it's like in London or yeah. something. I haven't been to London in a while. Manhattan rents just reached a new record high at $4,360. And accelerating rent inflation is a problem because for the Fed because housing has a weight of 40% in the CPI basket. Look at the housing stocks, Dan Nathan. Put the recently. lotion in the basket. Put yeah. the lotion in the basket. Yeah. So for all you folks thinking that, you know, this inflation is magically going to sort of get to the levels that we needed to get at, there are a lot of things still going. And now that we're past like the seasonality, the year over year bullshit that everybody talks about last June, I think being the high print in CPI, now the comps get a little bit different. So this whole CPI thing, which everybody thinks in the rearview mirror, I don't think it is. And that's why I think your four horsemen, your Yosemite yeah, Mount Sam guys, of, Mount yeah. Rushmore guys. Yeah. That's why I think they're so worried because they know what I'm trying to point out. They hear what I'm saying. I will tell you, Dan Nathan, I'm willing to bet that JP, Jerome Powell, is a listener of the On The Money, uh, not the On The Money, what am I saying here? 
the on the tape podcast back to you i would say it's very unlikely that he's why, why is it unlikely oh, by the way you've now sent me down podcast. the silence of the talking about the lambs clarice <laughs> you know lambs, I, I just yeah. want to this is where i think you, important no, though but this is where i kind of differ uh -oh. with you guys I, I i actually think so you started out by saying that um you know wage inflation and then you said that what's the biggest one is is housing shelter I think, shelter I, I think they're kind of canceling themselves out here okay and i feel like if you think of all those other inflationary inputs that we were worried about whether they be crude oil or they be food or the things that were impacting home builders lumber and copper and all the like they've all come down i i, I really wage inflation is not general mills okay said as but much, wage but, inflation yeah. is is an issue for corporate margins no i guess it. it's actually really, all really matters for households right yeah. and it basically offsets some of the other inflationary pressures that we might feel if deglobalization and reshoring and that sort of thing but all of those things will basically i mean they basically are, make the case of why in, in, wages will stay bid I guess the only point that I would make is that it's also the reason why every time the Fed has the opportunity to suggest that rates are going to stay higher for longer, because if you think of what real rates are going to be relative to, let's say, inflation never gets back to 2%, but maybe the new 2% is 3%, right? And so if you think about where interest rates went post-financial crisis, right, we had negative rates for a while. Now, if you look at real rates, they're like 1% or something like that with a CPI that's 4 and a Fed funds that's 5 and so maybe we just reset at a higher level for what I don't disagree. Place. I think well, I think Guy's point is that, you know, there's obviously they're going to go again in July and do they take another break or whatever they do and we're going to go into Jackson Hole. I think the point is that is it coming down to the extent we think it is and we're going to get relief from that at some point. I don't think you I don't think you can rely on Fed cutting rates. It's now been pushed out. I mean, it is it is far out the curve. You got to stretch the curve out to see where it's going to go. So, I think that's the point. I think you're making but at the same time if the expectations, the thing the Fed cares most about are people's inflation expectations, what do they expect to get paid? Mm -hmm. Where do they think inflation is going to go? That's like a big thing the Fed watches. So if these things creep up and people find themselves still paying more, the expectations have become self-fulfilling. But yeah, listen, we'll, we'll see. I mean, he indicated two more hikes, obviously, coming I mean, from- Emphatically. From, I mean, yeah. and he said they're not ruling out two consecutive hikes, too. And you just mentioned Jackson Hole. And Guy, you and I were talking about this a little bit earlier with Liz um, on Market Call. I mean. You know, it really feels like, obviously, the CME Fed fund tracker is suggesting a very, very high probability of a 25 basis point hike. The upper end of that band is going to be 5.5% of Fed funds. Jackson Hole, he gets out there. The air is really clear out there and clean and everything like that. <laughs> and maybe they say, Sep, we're going to go 25, and then you're going to get your pause. Then yeah. you guys are going to get your pause. And that could be a real moment, I think, for market participants one way or another. And then you have to settle in on what does an economy with five and a half percent, you know, Fed funds rate look like with inflation that is going to, listen, it's going to continue to go down despite the fact that we see these comparisons year over year going to get better. But listen, dude, crude oil can't get out of its By own By the way, here, listen, people. let me like, just say this. Like we're, we're dancing up here against, you know, two year hitting close to 5% again. Yeah. I realize there's some window dressing going on as we sit here. We talked about First week in June, we were on here, you know, buying begets buying, like people can't be on the sidelines. And now you got to underweight, you got to sell some bonds and own some equities here as you go into window dress and the quarter end. But here's something that's interesting if I could shift gears for a second. Please. So Fidelity just announced that they're going to start converting more of their mutual funds to ETFs. Now, these are actively managed ETFs. They'll take a, they, they give examples or six funds are going to convert. It's $13 billion. It's not, uh, it's not a huge amount relative to, um, to their entire portfolio. And I think now, I think after they do this and so forth, I think the conversion trend is approaching $100 billion total across the board. Here's what's interesting about that. The one thing, forget about fees, they're saying it's better for tax purposes, it's lower fees, this and the other. The transparency part of it, which has now become a positive versus anything where you have an edge, right? So you're seeing daily um, kind of ownership of names. It used to be you get them quarterly, right? Or you still get them quarterly if you file these mm -hmm quarterly statements, right? It's a big deal when you see big, I find it interesting how full transparency, you kind of lose your edge. So they're doing it obviously for many reasons, they're doing it because a lot of these active managed funds are underperforming some of the indices and maybe get, I just find it interesting. And, and I, I'm not, I'm not saying it's good or bad. I just think it's a trend to watch for these guys to come on. And I believe there's a patent expiration coming for Vanguard in some capacity on mm -hmm. some ETF mechanism that's going to allow this to occur even more so. Don't, don't at me if I'm wrong, but mm -hmm. there is something. But I just find that interesting because the secret sauce of being a fund manager, being able to build a position over, if you start to take it, now you're going to see potentially flurry into a name, I would think. If you're, 
if you're a fund manager and it's not a mutual fund, it's an ETF, you're going to know the next day, right? Mm -hmm. What I'm buying. What if I'm starting to sell my NVIDIA? I, mean, I hate to bring that name up, Dan. I don't trigger. But what if I'm starting to sell what I'm, you know, go and I'm known to be a holder? That's a really interesting dynamic mm -hmm. to me and something that I think will affect, again, doesn't matter. So you're, you're not going to make money off of it. Relative to like 13 Fs that are 45 days for large holders, like all that. Well, sort just of in data. general, the no, secret know, sauce yeah. of why you pay these extra fees to fund mutual fund managers is they take the time. They don't have to worry about knowing what everyone's yeah. doing in the exact moment. And this is full transparency. Now, it's a small amount. They're testing it out in certain areas, and I'm sure they're testing it out in certain funds. Maybe that I'm not saying they're not doing well or haven't been able to grow. Whatever it might be, whatever reason. To, I just find it interesting. A trend is something to watch, and so. From a trading perspective, I'd imagine it'll become more active, right? From a volume perspective, it could be wrong, but I don't know, it loses a little bit of the secret sauce. It's interesting. It. First of all, when you've said secret sauce, it makes me, of course, think of a Big Mac, which I haven't had in quite some time because the secret sauce actually sort of skeeved <laughs> me out just a tad wee bit, number one. Number two, when did you start, say we started this podcast? The January of 2021. January of 2021. Yeah. So this is June of 23. So it's is that two and a half years? Yeah. I would say... Over that period of time, so I think it's long enough to be able to say historically, when Danny Moses says things like this, that you know you should be watching out for this, he's proven to be prescient in those calls. And that's happened a number of different times. When you bring these things up that you've sort of been looking at a month, a couple months later, it's something that mainstream media seems to gravitate towards like a moth to a flame. <laughs> That's it. All right, we covered a lot of ground here. Uh, uh, as do you want to say, I got one other thing to uh, shout out for the show. Why you, oh, I can't, you can, all right. Go, no, you it's saying? your show. The Adler Group in Germany, right, which got raided today, okay? The I, Adlers? The, yeah, the Adlers. You know them from when you were a kid. Yeah, the next door neighbors, the Adlers. It was a German company, a landlord. It was a, it was a four or $5 billion company to speak. A short seller came in and wrote a report in October 2021 saying, mismarking their assets, whatever. I bring this up. Because I want to be, the stock was 20 bucks at the time, euro, went to 10 euro, it's now at 50 cents, it's gone. My point is that when someone has these short reports, mm -hmm. whether it's a Hindenburg or whatever, just please, it's worth reading. And now it turns out there's a certain character, right, Kane or whatever his name is, that was involved in the financial crisis, that was involved at the time, that somehow reincarnated himself to be associated with this. And my point is that people find their way into these companies, but people don't necessarily change. So culturally, these companies, just in general, but Anytime I get an opportunity to bring out what short sellers good they can do, and maybe that helps save people, I wanted to give it out, Dan. I appreciate that. Necessary. By the way, you, you mentioned Kane. Before we get out of here, uh, Dan Nathan, Adam raised a cane. Is that in your top fifteen of Bruce songs? No, but it's a great song. I mean, it's a it's a very dismissive there. No, it's a good I mean, song. It's, it's a great song. All right, so listen, a couple uh, little housekeeping Please. notes. Stick around for our conversation with Michael Cantrowitz Cantro. of Hyper Sandler, and uh, also. We have a, st a special drop on Monday. That would be July 3rd. And uh -huh. shout out to Liz Young. That's going to be her birthday, people. Maybe hit her up on whatever social media network you use uh, these days and wish her a happy birthday. She is a friend of the pod and a normal uh, participant on our Monday edition of On the Tape. But we're going to do something different on Monday's drop because it's a holiday-shortened day. I sit down with Zach Rotano. He is the CEO and founder of Roe, and Roe is a new a new brand sponsor of On The Tape Podcast, a co-presenting sponsor of OK Computer, and they also sponsor, Guy, our Monday edition of Market Call. Tremendous. You and I do live on XMSR, Business Channel 132. That, that's been a lot of fun. By the way, and again, I'm probably teasing something, but Danny Moses will sit in at some point. July 10. Summer. July 10. Danny's yes, going to be in 10. the studio. XMSR here. So crazy. check out our show um, on noon on XM uh, 132. That's going to be a serious XM uh, with Guy and myself this Monday. We also have a special pod drop of On the Tape with uh, Z, uh, a CEO, co-founder of Roe, and myself. So stick around, people. We got Michael Cantro when we come back. Introducing event contracts from CME Group for individual investors who want a new, less complex way to trade some of the world's most recognized futures markets. They're smaller, lower cost, with predefined risk. Event contracts let you trade your views on daily up or down price moves in equities, gold, oil, and more. The markets you know and use every day. Take a position by choosing a side with event contracts from CME Group. Learn more at cmegroup.com slash event contracts.
iConnections is the world's largest capital introduction platform in the alternative investment industry. They bring the asset management community together through a membership platform that lets allocators and managers meet and connect both physically and virtually. Over 3,000 allocators and 600 managers are part of the iConnections community, overseeing nearly $48 trillion and $16 trillion in assets, respectively. iConnections first came to our attention in 2020 during the first wave of the pandemic. That's when their first event, Funds for Food, became the largest virtual cap intro event in history. To date, they've donated nearly $2.5 million to charities. They are also the people behind the alternative investment industry's largest and most exciting in-person events. To find out more about iConnections events and members-only platform, visit iConnections.io. What's up? Guy here. Did you know FactSet is the official data provider for risk reversal media? FactSet is the key to all of our analysis. It's not just charts. FactSet provides insight into the top headlines of the day, private markets, and sector-specific data. If you ever have issues, get help from their support team that is committed to your success. Visit FactSet.com to experience the power of FactSet and request a free trial and unlock access to the tools that matter most to you. Hey, it's Dan here. Are you tired of struggling with your weight? I know I was. That's why I turned to Roe. They've developed a revolutionary medication approved by the FDA specifically for weight loss. It's paired with lifestyle coaching, so the weight comes off and stays off. I started with a free online visit and connected with a U.S. licensed healthcare professional. They prescribed the medication that's helped me drop 30 pounds in the last four months. And now Roe is offering a discount just for our listeners. To get our special offer, go to roe.co slash tape. You'll pay just $99 for the first month and $145 per month thereafter. If prescribed, medication cost is separate. That's ro.co slash tape. Welcome back to On the Tape. We are joined by Michael Kantrowitz, Chief Investment Strategist from Piper Sandler, was with us um, kind of the fall of last year. October. Uh, October last of 2022. Year. And I have to open with this, Cantro, because that's what you're affectionately known as, is, is that Hope is a dangerous thing, my friend. Uh, and we're going to get right into the hope trade. We're going to get to that, obviously. But uh, welcome back to On the Tape. And a uh, lot's been happening, my man. And so you and I converse from time to time on Twitter. I read your stuff all the time. Um, certainly, I share in a lot of your sentiment. Uh, and you bring great data. And you really do the work behind everything that you do. So no one can say that uh, you're just throwing things out there. Because I think you have the data to support it. So welcome back. And, and let's start. I mean, you lead us in here, my man. Uh, well, yeah, lots, uh, changed since October. Um, certainly we've, uh, if anything, we've kind of gone from one extreme of sentiment to, uh, I would say the opposite extreme in sentiment, um, at the lows in October, people were really worried about a lot of different things, uh, not just domestically, but globally with China shut down, Europe having a potential, uh, frozen winter and the fed, you know, raising rates and uh, putting the economy into recession much earlier. Uh, I think those risks, uh, have massively allevi uh, been alleviated uh, since October. Uh, we even got to a point in January where the uh, the no landing concept came came back out. Uh, first first time I've ever heard no landing or read no landing actually was August 11th of 2000. Uh, Larry Kudlow uh, was quoted in a Wall Street Journal article talking about uh, how great the economy was and how this technologically innovative economy is not going to slow down, uh, is not going to even land. Shocking. So um, most stocks, actually, if we look back this year, uh, just looking at the S&P 500, most stocks year to date high was on February 2nd. 184 stocks in the S&P 500 are above their February 2nd levels as of today. Uh, why does that date matter? Uh, that was... Uh, in my opinion, kind of a blow off top in in breadth uh, coming on the back of a Fed pivot rally that started in October that ended with a uh, a no landing uh, sentiment from investors. And so that's where you had the most number of stocks at their year to date highs. Since then, yes, the indices have gone up quite a bit, but as we all know, it's been uh, far more bifurcated, uh, far more narrow. And I think what people are trying to figure out today uh, is, is if this new bull market, if you want to call it that, uh, is indeed a broad-based bull market or, or will become one. Uh, and uh, obviously, we have some strong opinions there. So let's 
kind of where we are uh, so, debating the most right now with clients. Yeah, we often cite February 2nd, you know, kind of the first chase at the beginning of the year. People came in kind of net short, found themselves underweight, tech, overweight, energy, and financials. And throughout the month of January, kind of pivoted and started to chase, kind of got slapped in the face a little bit in February. And this rally kind of resumed here. But, you know, I opened with kind of the hope is a dangerous thing because hope, you know, you do yeah. follow four key categories, the housing, the orders, profit, and employment. And obviously the charts are all over the place. I mean, they're all have their own kind of story, un, you know, unto themselves. Can you just yeah. walk through those four things? Because I don't think it's really giving me, maybe it's giving you a clear sign of anything. This is unlike anything we've seen as far as if you want to call it a, some type of recovery or stagnation, whatever it might be. I'd love to get your thoughts there. Yeah. And we can translate that into what we're seeing in the marketplace um, with regards to, you know, what has worked and what hasn't worked this year. Um, so HOPE, again, uh, stands for, it's an acronym. Uh, it's a simplification of the sequence in the uh, business cycle of how changes in interest rates uh, translate into better or worse economic activity, starting with housing is the H. Uh, o is PMIs uh, or orders. Uh, the P is profit growth. And the E is employment. And we are at a stage in the cycle, uh, and when you go throughout history, you know, there's been eight recessions since 1960, so not, not a ton to pull from, and each one had its own unique idiosyncrasies around the problems in the economy, the secular backdrops being different, uh, and, and this one, uh, in this backdrop, uh, that's the similarity that, you know, people are arguing, well, it's different this time. This time, we won't go into recession because of X, Y, and Z, and there's always uh, a, a view on that. Uh, that changes in each cycle. So what have we seen uh, since October? PMIs have gotten even worse. Uh, the ISM manufacturing index new orders is sitting at about 42 and change. We've seen a bunch of the regional PMIs. Uh, uh, Kansas City Fed got real, real ugly. Um, Empire of Philly Fed. So, so, so to your point, Danny, there's a lot of different data sets uh, and you could cherry pick one or two of them to kind of come up with your own narrative. Uh, profit growth, has uh, been better than expected in larger caps, and I think been worse than expected in smaller caps, uh, which is behind some of the leadership this year in large caps. Um, and then employment, uh, we'll get to housing, of course, but employment uh, is now on people's radar. It was not on the radar, I would argue, back in, uh, in, in uh, October of last year. Uh, I don't think employment was at all an issue for the economy in 2022 uh, or profits, uh, whereas now uh, the increase in claims we've started to see in the last two months uh, is slowly working its way up the, the concern list of investors. It is by far from uh, atop that list, but uh, it is uh, certainly creeping up. My conversations with clients tend to start off with employment today, whereas six months ago, it was all inflation, inflation, inflation in the Fed. The, the period where we are now and and you know, what, what I have to recognize, and it could be different this time, uh, and there are many differences this time, the secular backdrop for housing is different. Um, but when you look at the housing data, you know, we've seen some improvement in the NHB index. Builder sentiment has bounced a, a bunch. It also collapsed last year. Uh, and I think, you know, that's the simplification of the, the macro in the market in the last 18 months. What got hit the most last year has bounced the most this year. And I think that simplifies to that Everything that got hit the most last year was due to rates, and we've had a rate relief rally um, in, the, uh, in the last seven or eight months. Uh, and so housing has bounced, obviously, with this massive historic bifurcation between new and existing home sales. Uh, a lot of people are looking at the, the new housing data, the you know, building starts, uh, housing starts, and saying, well, look, housing is bottomed, a new recovery has begun. And... Uh, how housing is different this time. And obviously people are locked in their homes, so you're not seeing many existing home sales. Um, and one thing is that when the Fed's about done or when the market thinks the Fed's done, but before employment claims start to really rise, uh, historically you always see a bounce in the housing data. So it, uh, in that context, this bounce is quite normal. Um, how long that lasts across different cycles is, is again, very variable. Um, in, in, in 2000, how, housing barely weakened. Obviously, in 07 and 08, it collapsed. In 1990, it, it got hit for you know, a couple quarters. Uh, and so there's no necessarily rhyme or reason for how many months housing can 
uh, stabilize or, or improve uh, from uh, a tightening cycle that kind of got uh, dented it uh, quite a bit. What one of the things I'm thinking about is, you know, obviously I see the housing data improving, and that's that's usually you know a, a really important part of our process because that tends to be the beginning of a recovery. But I'm wondering if this dynamic today with you know, existing home sales being massively uh, under pressure and new home sales having to fill that gap uh, and the mix shift of, you know, really what creates the multiplier effect in our economy? Is it new home sales or is it sales from existing home sales? Uh, or if we think about the stock level, obviously Lennar is going to benefit massively from this. I'm not so sure Home Depot really is a winner in this backdrop. To me, they, they get more benefit from existing home sales. And actually, if you look at a ratio of new to existing home sales and Lennar, for example, or Toll Brothers, or any builder relative to Home Depot or Lowe's, it's the same chart. Uh, and so ultimately, it goes to the question of, is this housing rebound we've seen more than just the end of a tightening cycle? And if it is, will it have the same multiplier effect that we have seen in past cycles when housing rebounds as a function of more demand and lower interest rates, which helps the entire economy? Whereas this is more of a supply issue. So that's kind of, I'm speaking out loud here and just kind of talking to you what, what, with what I'm thinking about now. You know, are we over extrapolating this rebound in housing? Not that it's not real, but can we just regress it with all other data sets we know that historically improve with housing, but really aren't uh, as of today? You know, it's interesting. And, and that's a great example, the, the Lennar versus Home Depot and the multiplier effect. I mean, you know, Home Depot is 25% is, is off of its all-time highs made in late 2021 um, when I think the story, the narrative in and around housing was very different. And now that shifted. It has to do with rates. It has to do with supply demand. It has to do with a whole host of other demographic sort of switches. And, and Lennar is just basically trading near um, all-time highs. But I want to go from the H, the housing, to the P, that would be profits. And, yeah. you know, we track John Butters. He's the senior earnings insight analyst over there at FactSet, some of the data that he has about um, just, and, and this is the here and now, right? So he's tracking the um, earnings estimate, the aggregate cuts over the course of Q2. And this quarter, um, they came in about 2.7%. That's below the 5, 10, 15, and 20 year averages. And, you know, it's interesting when you were, when he was tracking that data um, in the prior few quarters or so, those earnings estimate cuts over the course of the quarter were coming in um, well above those averages over those time periods, right? And so when you think about that, are we setting up, Kentra, do you think, uh, are, are we getting a little bit off sides? But the only, the only issue that I have with this data is that when he drills down on the sector le uh, level, you're seeing earnings revisions higher for information services. And we know that those are the big platform companies and those are the big companies that at least in the stock market have enjoyed, right, a lot of the positive sentiment in and around AI. So speak to that a little bit because that's one thing I think that is kind of putting some sort of, uh, you know, when we think about retesting the October lows in the S&P 500, I mean, man, we'd be happy just to get unchanged if you thought some of the positive sentiment had to come out because 3,600 seems like a ways away from 4,400 right now. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, again, one thing to think about, and, and, and again, things can play out, take longer to play out. They could, they could take shorter periods to play out. Um, again, one of the historical echoes is that, you know, if we look back at past beginnings to bear markets that were results of rising unemployment, most of them started at all-time highs in the S&P. Like October 07, we were at all-time highs. Um, October of 2000, after the massive pivot rally in the summer of 2000, we went back to all-time highs on the S&P. Uh, in, in 1990, we started off that bear market from all-time highs. So it's not uncommon for, again, sentiment to go from, oh, no, the Fed's raising rates and things are going to get bad, to flipping 180 degrees back to uh, a really uh, euphoric uh, sentiment. If anything, uh, that is very normal. So with regards to earnings, um, so just to kind of reset the um, kind of refresh for where we, where we were at the beginning of the year. Yes, we have a uh, year end call that the market's going to go down sharply in the second half. Uh, our view in the first half, however, was uh, unlike some of the other uh, quote bears. Uh, I know you guys are friends with uh, and chat with many of them uh, was that the equity market was not going to go down the first half. Uh, we didn't see that as a likely event. Uh, in fact, our view is that 
if we started to see claims go up in the first half, that would be a very bullish event for equity markets because it would, for certain, take all the heat from more rate hikes uh, out of the out of the equation. And uh, mind you, the the banking crisis in March did a lot of that work uh, already. Uh, and you know, the last few weeks when we've seen claims go up, you've seen the Nasdaq up a percent each uh, each of the last three weeks. Uh, not not today. And so the mar money has chased. Um, sorry. So. In the first half, that was kind of our market view, and we recommended being in high-quality growth stocks. And the reason was very simple. We thought we were going to see earnings continue to slow, still view that uh, as the outlook, and that we would get to this a point where the market would say, okay, the Fed's done, and get that classic relief rally you always see at the end of a tightening cycle, and that it would likely be money moving into companies that have growth. Um, that's something we didn't see last year. Uh, at all, because earnings growth was pretty strong on a broad basis. When we look at the stocks this year that have seen the best appreciation and price, it's come not just from PE expansion, but from a combination of earnings uh, revisions, positive earnings revisions, and PE expansion. If anything, investors are doubling up. Any company that has better relative earnings is also seeing, uh, in most cases, relative PE expansion as well. So when we think about the next couple quarters, um, you know, we kind of view what we do in, in, in two separate uh, frameworks. So like there's the market view, which, you know, market calls are binary events. They are events. Uh, and, and, you know, generally what we're focused on for our clients is positioning because that is a process that is um, hi highly consistent around profit growth cycles, PMI cycles, uh, employment cycles. Um, in the last six months, profit growth has slowed. Leadership has been massively large cap growth uh, uh, and skewed um, like we haven't seen in many, many years. And that all makes sense. And it got exacerbated by AI. It got exacerbated by the, uh, the banking crisis. Um, but I think this backdrop of slowing earnings growth is going to persist. You know, why don't we want to jump into small caps right now? Why have small caps been sitting sideways for more or less the last, you know, year even even since October, it's not like small. The Russell 2000 is that much off its lows, and I think the simple answer is that you've already seen 30 something percent PE expansion in the small cap index. But at the same time, since October, earnings estimates are down 19 percent on a forward basis. That is simply why small caps are lagging because PE expansion can only carry something so far. If there's no earnings behind it, that's going to improve immediately. And yeah, there, it gets to a point where PEs can't continue to expand. So I, yeah, we're recommending you stay with these growth stocks. You stay with companies that have better earnings revisions, that have better visibility, uh, better balance sheets, uh, that are less cyclical. We don't see a real strong catalyst for any sustained improvement in breadth and in cyclical leadership and in small cap leadership or value leadership, because what is required to get a sustainable move is a cyclical broad-based recovery in the macro data. Broad, broad market recoveries require broad macro recoveries. And that is just not in the cards in 2023. So on that note, you said you came into the year, you know, not bearish. You weren't overly bullish, but you know, you certainly said to own no, definitely own, own some type of quality. I don't know if you were I don't think you were overly bullish coming into the beginning of the year. No, 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 okay. absolutely not. We were calling for a range bound so, market. So I'd say, you know, what the equal weighted index has done was kind of our call, which is, you know, it was up three percent, uh, you know, four percent uh year to date. Uh we favored or uh, recommended positioning within growth stocks. So we we're on the right side of leadership, but um, you know, did I expect the NASDAQ to jump up? 38% or, you know, wherever it no, is. No, no, what I was going to say was, what I was going to say, Cantra, was if I had given you the levels, we were sitting here today and I said, yep. okay, the S&P is at 4,400, whatever, give you the NASDAQ levels. You could say, all right, that's interesting. Let me go back and tell you what the breadth looked like. And I think you just kind of went through that, that it's not healthy, that it's not what you would think it would be. If you had to fill those blanks in, it probably wouldn't be seven stocks comprising the majority, you know, majority of all gains. And flip that also is that I think from a weirdly, no one had the Fed going, you know, I think this much more. Certainly people that were bearish believed the Fed was probably almost done. They weren't bearish because they thought the Fed was going to drive us further potentially into yeah. slowness, right? 
And even the, I think the people were bullish because the Fed was going to stop. So here we are, the Fed keeps going. And I'll throw in what you mentioned, which was no way to handicap and no one really had this event on their bingo card was this banking crisis, which, you know, kind of came went and then brought in more liquidity into the system and on the balance sheet, yeah. right? So again, all these things we can, we can look back and piece it together. And I think you just touched on it, but I think it's key to go back to, is it just the market breadth and the sustainability or the ability of these kind of horsemen to sustain this market higher without the rest of the participation coming into play here? And I think that to me is, I think what you're saying is going to be the theme in the back half of the year. Yeah, and and the the debate uh, of whether you know the housing data we've seen improving is a bounce, and i.e., is it sustainable? And ultimately, what you need to see is PMIs, and and uh, is to cyclically pick up. And now there's never been a recovery in PMIs. This goes back to the '50s without Fed easing. Never happened. Not saying it can't happen because anything's possible. Yeah, I've certainly learned that throughout my career, but. Um, the odds of it happening are quite low. And so this idea that we're in a new bull market, I think one, it's important to recognize where are we coming from? You know, rare, rarely, and so talk about things that have never happened, find me a Fed tightening cycle with a, where the NASDAQ's down 35% in 10 months without employment deteriorating. You can't, it's never happened. We've never had such an inflation shock at the time where we just came off a pandemic bubble. I mean, the perfect storm in, 20, in the beginning of 2022 regarding inflation. And I think that we could be resetting ourselves up for a similar behavioral bias that people believe employment is just not going to weaken because that also hasn't happened. You know, if you take aside COVID, we haven't had an employment downturn in 16 years, uh, starting since 07. So there's a lot of um, similar to the view that inflation and interest rates could never go up, which was the view of the market on Jan 1, 2022, um, that obviously changed. I think we have a similar backdrop on employment today because of that muscle memory or lack of muscle memory. How do you factor in Europe? Obviously pretty slow here, Germany in a recession, China kind of can't get the ball rolling there. How does that factor into kind of your mindset or your thoughts in terms of strategy? So they're obviously they're still, they're still the ECB is still tightening, you know, the, uh, Europe, uh, broad, broader, uh, broader Europe, uh, is, somewhat behind the curve in terms of the tightening cycle relative to the U.S. Um, you know, Germany, you know, Germany's in a recession and, and, you know, you think recession, but you look at the stock market and you're like, well, that doesn't really kind of look like a, a stock market that's in a, uh, in a recession. And this goes back to employment. Um, you know, in, 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 in Europe uh, or even in Germany, um, you've had some, some negative data, but employment has yet to really sharply roll over. Uh, and you, you know, recession in in my book, uh, and really in the market's book, it's not a, not so not so much about GDP, but it's about employment uh, because that's what really creates systemic problems. That's when people default, and you know, it creates that negative feedback loop. Forward indicators of Europe's trajectory from here, like the eurozone PMI or uh, the IFO or the ZOO indices, uh, leading indicators of those indices suggest there's there's another six to nine months of downside uh, in those data. Uh, so just like the US, uh, we, which we see a similar outlook, uh, I think we're, again, we're kind of slowly moving into this downturn, but people are, you know, it's, talk about not seeing layoffs in the US. I mean, in Europe, obviously it's, it's much less uh, common uh, for companies to do layoffs, uh, you know, especially countries like France. Uh, and so same story though, that where is the cyclical recovery going to come from? Where's the, where's the easing going to come from? We've already had 12 months now of lower oil, lower gasoline prices, lower natural gas prices. And we have to factor that in, that that's been a huge stimulus in the face of higher rates, which has kept the U.S. economy and the global economy, especially Europe, um, much healthier, all else equal. We're not going to get another 30, 40% drop in energy prices without economic pain, in my opinion. Uh, and that, that's kind of helped certainly Europe uh, and uh, definitely the U.S. consumer in the last 12 months. Um, you know, there's not another round of SPRs to be released. Yeah, China's uh, kind of a hot mess. Um, you know, I think, again, a lot of people were kind of real bullish on their reopening and that kind of fizzled out pretty quickly. Um, we kind of think China's one of the countries in more of a secular uh, stagnation uh, from their massive investment boom uh, starting in 2000. 
Um, and they're going to continue to be much more uh, intentional with their stimulus policy as opposed to seeing broad-based stimulus like we did in the U.S. or even in past periods when China was slow. So we kind of see uh, China being more of a kind of not a problem, but not a solution uh, in the grand scheme of things. So, so Cantor, bringing it back to the stock market here, because I, you know, Danny kind of laid out the, the, the sentiment in January after, you know, it was a pretty dismal year for stocks and, and investors and, and basically, you know, uh, you know, everywhere you looked, um, you know, the, the, the China pivot from zero COVID certainly got things going in January. And when I think about the S and P 500, you know, now here we are, you know, six months later, we are 25% off of those October lows. We're 15% off of the March lows when, you know, really a whole heck of a lot of uncertainty about what was going on um, in the regional banking sector and the potential for it to kind of spill over and what that meant for economic growth and the like here. And so when I think about kind of where we are and I think about your call in, in, in high growth, you know, um, even though they were high valuation, you know, these, these kind of you know, what, what you would say, like defensible moats in the large mega cap tech space, what could lead to the downside? If you're still saying stick with those names because they're going to act well on a relative basis, and if we do have some sort of economic shock that causes stocks to kind of turn lower a little bit, what's going to lead? Because we already have the lag of small caps. We have the lag of energy, right? We're seeing materials and, and some of those names. They're, they're like, those are like the real economy stocks. You know, financials yeah. have underperformed today. We're recording this Thursday afternoon with, you know, the 10-year yield is up 14, 15 basis points. We're seeing many of the money center banks screaming right now a little bit higher, you know, that sort of thing after the stress test too in a way. So I'm just curious what you would kind of suggest to investors um, to keep an eye on for the downside. If it's not going to be these large platform companies, because to me, I don't know how we test 4,000 and then let's say 3,600 again, if it's not going to be Apple, Microsoft, you know, Google, Amazon, NVIDIA, Tesla leading to the downside, because those seven stocks, I'm, I might be missing one, are $10 trillion in market cap. And they are basically all of the S&P 500's gains. Yep. And and if you think about it, I mean, they got massively hit. S&P was down 25% at its low last year. Uh, and what's this year? It's more or less the opposite of, of yeah. last year. Um, and, and again, I, I think the way I look at it is that last year, and, and I'm sure this is a, a debatable topic, that people thought, well, the market was down because we were pricing in a recession. And I, I think it's just a wrong take on what happened last year. Uh, and that Really, there's little evidence of that, you know that's really what was uh, driving the market to the downside. If anything, small cap uh, or large cap pure value stocks at their worst. So the most cyclical part of the S and P 500 was only down 13 uh, percent in October, while the Nasdaq at that same point in time was down 35. So we've now seen this massive PE expansion uh, across the board, and even you mentioned small caps, Dan. You know, they've seen 33%. The Russell 2000 has seen its PE increase by 33% since October. That can go right backwards, mm -hmm. uh, particularly if earnings uh, uh, fall sharply. Uh, and so the answer to your question is, what's the macro catalyst? It's always employment. It's always employment. I mean, if, if you really want to think about what's a bear market, it's really, it's when employment deteriorates, the you know, claims are rising, the unemployment rate's rising, credit spreads are rising, the yield curve steepening because we're pricing in, you know, cuts or more cuts. That to me is a real bear market because that can't get turned around by a policy cut uh, or really anything. And the only time historically the economy's ever turned around on a dime is during the pandemic uh, with all that stimulus, which is not going to happen again. So the answer is, you know, can those stocks go down? Apple, you know, all, all uh, um, NVIDIA, uh, et cetera. Absolutely, they can fall 20, 30 percent. Uh, I know it's, it, it doesn't seem like that's likelihood because look, they're going up so much, you know, and we're all victims of uh, recency bias. Um, but if we get a proper recession with unemployment rising uh, and claims getting to 300,000, 325,000, we think by uh, late, late this year, um, we're going to see credit issues and we're going to see even those names fall. I think, though, that 
you still want to remain as again, our clients are positioning within the market and have to remain invested somewhere. Uh, defense has been left for dead. Uh, so that'll likely relatively hold up better if claims do follow the path we expect and the leading indicators suggest. Uh, but I, I think I would argue that smaller caps, cyclicals uh, are going to get hit harder than um, yeah, even, you know, can NVIDIA fall 30%? Absolutely. Uh, is it going to fall 80%? Like Amazon, you know, was trading at a 40 times uh, sales multiple in 2000. It fell 80, 90%, but it was an immature company back then. NVIDIA is far more profitable, far more mature. Uh, and so, again, you know, I think the market call becomes very binary and it's not a great way to think about, you know, how to invest from here. Where we have conviction and where we have visibility is that the likelihood of a cyclical upturn mm -hmm. broadly is extremely low today um, for all the right reasons that have historically shaped the business cycle. The best case scenario for stocks is that we just grind out this slowdown and allow inflation to come down without really claims moving up a lot, which is kind of the bullish story. But that to me continues to propel growthier, profitable, healthier companies to continue to outperform. I don't think people are buying banks, auto companies, um, and other cyclical areas of the market, energy, without the data broadly improving, and we're not seeing that. Yeah, well, well, well they're buying one auto company. Um, I just want to make one point that, that you just made, that, 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 you know, a lot of those growth companies are not the growth companies of 99 and 2000 that when the NASDAQ lost 80 some percent. I think it's really important for people to remember that the backdrop, okay, from the highs in 2021 to where we are right now is not that different, okay, a year and a half, two years later, and, and three companies, that people loved then lost 75% of their value. And you know what they are? They were Tesla, they were NVIDIA, and they were Facebook, Meta. And so to think that that couldn't happen again if the NASDAQ were to come in 35% is, I, I think, a big misnomer. I mean, because it just happened. You know what I mean? And you could say that those moats are you know, stronger and, and maybe the economy is now going to be changing because of this newfound euphoric AI thing. Well, AI was around then and these companies were spending hundreds of millions or, or billions of dollars then okay but what they didn't have is a commercialized product like chat gpt that a lot of other companies now have been chasing so i just think that again the narrative is clearly shifted but don't don't be mistaken these companies can get cut in half or at least the stocks can again with not too much change i think in the environment you know like a recession that would lead to a like let's say a protracted bear market again and i think all of those stocks would be cut in half and maybe then so well yeah and and that goes back to the point we go from october and we look at the s p and we disaggregate the gain in the s p or the nasdaq since october um it's all been multiple expansion and the nasdaq has had a little bit of earnings growth which again is is, is a few companies but if you look at the S&P 500, earnings on a forward 12-month basis are exactly where they were on, in October of 2022 today. The entire move in the S&P has been PE expansion. Now, PE expansion and PE compression it, are, create very volatile markets and can change very quickly, right? Just like we saw from, you know, PEs collapsed the first 10 months of last year, and PEs have shot up uh, in the last eight months uh, since October. Uh, that that is that is you know, going back to hope is a dangerous thing. <laughs> PE expansion is hope. PE compression is fear. It's fundamentals that stabilize the market and stabilize the economy or earnings. And we're just not you know we're not seeing that broad based pickup. And you know one of the things I want to make sure I get in before our, our time is up is you know if, not only is this again following a lot of the behavioral patterns and there's a lot of uh, rhymes of today's backdrop to past periods where uh, the Fed was about done, but employment hadn't really rolled over. The last time we saw growth beat uh, the Nas or the NASDAQ outperform the S&P by this much, or even the equal weighted index before this was in, was in 07. And we saw the same thing in 2000, in the summer of 2000. What's in common with, with today in those two periods, where they were, they, were, they were both at the end of a Fed tightening cycle. And so, you know, the more historical digging I do, it only kind of keeps bringing me back to the same conclusion. Again, maybe it's different this time, but that is always the most bullish sentiment 
uh, in this backdrop that it is different this time. It's just always something different. Today it's AI. It was dot com in 07. I'm sorry, dot com in 2000. You know, energy was in a bubble in, in 07 and 08. You know, that was different this time. Uh, and, but you know, historically, it never, it never really is. Um, but you know, maybe this, this time will be different. We have to entertain that. But the one thing that, that I keep going back to that is screaming in our framework that this is not the beginning of a broad-based recovery in equities or the economy is our sell model. And this goes back to, you, Dan, you were mentioning about 2000, you know, the unique part of what the leadership is today in the equ equity market, it's quality, it's profitability. It's companies with great balance sheets and income. Um, you know, the tech bubble from 99 to 2000 was all companies that had no earnings. That is, it couldn't be more uh, different today, uh, at least thus far. In fact, negative earning tech companies are massively underperforming those that have profitability. And so the thing that's screaming out in our framework is our sell model. We've been running a sell model for uh, just an, over a decade, and we have it back tested back to the mid 80s. And it's a handful of fundamental attributes that you really don't want to own companies with these types of red flag attributes, you know, whether it's accounting uh, anomalies, you're looking for poor quality of reporting, um, really high valuation companies that are you know, selling more equity, uh, their days depreciation is changing, you know, they're kind of fudging their numbers or you know, have evidence of that. Um, that's our sell model. There's the only time the sell model gets blows up in your face, we'll use that, uh, is at the beginning of an economic recovery. And we saw it in uh, March of 2020 for about 12 months. We saw it in March of 09 for about 12 months. We saw it in March of 03 for 12 months. We saw it in 2016 for about 12 months where low quality stocks, or, or you know, sometimes people call them junk stocks, rip and they maintain leadership. And that is glaringly missing in this quote, new bull market. Our short model is sitting on its bottom, literally today at its low, um, going back 25 years or as far back, we, uh, 30 years, we have it back tested. Um, that is not the sign of a new bull market or certainly a healthy market. If this was really a new bull market that was broadly uh, driven, you'd see low quality stocks ripping sustainably and we're not. And so that just continues to point us back in the direction of this looks a lot more like a pivot rally. Fed's done. And the economy is going to bottom and we're going to have a soft landing. That's the narrative that we're in today. It does not look like the beginning of a new sustainable uh, bull market. And I think, you know, everyone kind of knows that and you know, people are debating whether or not that can happen. But, uh, you know, we don't think it's likely. Yeah, that's why I track the meme stocks, not because I'm going to trade them, because I want to look and see what's in your face and what the health of the retail you know, you know, investor is. And, you know, before we get out of here, um, to me, well, I want to ask you one question. Do you get paid some type of royalty? Anyone says hashtag hope. That was the first thing I was going to ask you. But, I, think, but, I think religion religion, <laughs> religion, beat me to that. Exactly. That's true. That's true. But the second thing was just as we, you know, we look to your point, and I think you're, you're spot on kind of about the jobs leading everything, right? I can look at this market right now and say, or look at what's going on within the economy and everything, and the S&P could be at 3,500. And you could have, we could have having all the same arguments that are going on with the S&P at 4,400, whether you believe it's a trough, whether it's the peak in earnings, whatever it might be, right? You could paint. Behind the scenes, bankruptcies are on a pace that we haven't seen in years. Not public companies necessarily, but private companies. Probably you can no longer access credit. That has a self-fulfilling impact, an actual impact, obviously, on employment and things. And so I guess my last question to you is, we're going to get through a period of time here where employment, unemployment's going to rise. It has to. It has one direction to go, right? We see the trends are in place. And the hope will be that the Fed's done. And you made the point, and just bring it back together for me as we get out of here, that handoff of, okay, but now the Fed's done. They're going to cut. It's not going to matter. Because I think I want to hammer home the point that you just made about the momentum going the other way in the markets on this economic data. It just doesn't turn like that. So I guess what I'm asking is, is there a level of continuing or weekly jobless claims where you get to a point where like, now you're, now there's no going back. This is, a, you know, we are about to see sometimes. So lead us out with that, even though I don't hate leading us out with negative things, just lead us out with kind of well, no, it's, how to help investors yeah. navigate that last piece and then we'll get out of here. Sure. And uh, by the way, you owe me five bucks. You, said, you just said hope. So that's, that starts now. That was for religious reasons, hoping the market goes down. <laughs> but anyway, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, listen, um, nobody more than me 
is exhausted by you know this kind of um, this long process playing out uh, and 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 wants to be more bullish uh, and broadly bullish uh, on the market. Um, and you know, I, again, every time I kind of try to see the scenarios that would lead to broad participation, it really is hard to get get to that conclusion with conviction and remaining kind of true to our framework and our values. Um, here, here's the tricky thing about this cycle specifically. Uh, a couple things. Number one, uh, there's 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 this. Uh, I mean, you, I'm sure you guys have heard it a million times. You know, it's taking so long for employment to soften. You know, people are so shocked that it's not worse by now. I've literally yet to see anyone actually quantify that. In other words, like it feels like employment's taking a long time to to turn over b- because. Maybe it feels like that because the market was down last year. Maybe it feels like that because employment, uh, I'm sorry, the Fed was raising rates quick, quick, quickly. And we should just assume that a, a rapid tightening cycle should lead to a rapid employment contraction. Um, so that's, I'm sure you guys have heard that a lot. We looked at a way to quantify that and kind of ask ourselves, is employment really taking a long time to slow? And we did it in a number of ways. The simplest way to do it is say, well, let's look at a yield curve and say, well, when that inverts, let's start the clock. And we look at the 10 year, three month yield curve. And we look at the last eight recessions. Claims are exactly on track of where they quote should be or are, are on average, again, only eight examples. Um, when you look at that, uh, when we look at the lag effect of housing data that turned down last year, which leads claims by about a year, a year and a quarter, that's kind of on track. So this the narrative or view that everything's taking a long time to turn down, when you look at the data, it doesn't really, that's not, that doesn't seem true. People uh, using the stock market as their data, that's it. Well, yeah, but, and, but to yeah. your point, and you started this off by saying it, it's exhausting. What's exhausting is what the stock market is doing in face of the data. Um, so, you know, we, we, we get all that. And again, you know, like, We all want to be a bit more constructive on things, but if you're just focused, I guess, on the lagging indicators rather than the stuff that you are basically keeping you true to that framework, the leading stuff is not giving you more confidence about that. And that's the problem, I guess, if you're a pundit and you have podcasts or you're talking on TV all the time or you are talking to your clients, it does get a little exhausting um, playing that waiting game. Well, listen, Michael Kantrowitz, we really appreciate you coming back. We hope that you will come back. Um, again, in the not so distant future. So thanks a lot for joining us. If I could just leave you with, you know, if I knew the magic level, you know, cl- will claim continue to rise? That's question number one. And question number two, Danny, to your question is, at what point will investors react negatively to that and stop seeing rising claims or bad macro data as good news that removes CPI and the Fed off our back to bad news that create credit issues? Uh, I think that's going to be the debate going forward. Uh, and so we'll look forward to speaking with you guys again soon. Thanks, man. Great. Appreciate thanks, Cantro.